The last part of this lecture deals with the electron configuration of cations and anions. We're actually starting Chapter 4, where we investigate different types of bonds. Ionic compounds have non-directional bonds, which are held together by electrostatic charge. Covalent bonds have directional bonds, which are the sharing of electrons between atoms. Metallic bonds we'll get to in Chapter 8. These are also non-directional, and they can be envisioned as cations held together in a sea of electrons. So when we think about the electron configurations of anions and cations, the goal of elements is to gain or lose electrons to get a noble gas core since those are very stable. So remember that nonmetals have high electronegativity and metals have low electronegativity and low ionization energy. That means nonmetals are electron grabbers, metals are electron givers. So a nonmetal gains electrons and in doing so becomes an anion, which is isoelectronic with its nearest noble gas. A metal loses electrons to become a cation, which is isoelectronic with its nearest noble gas. Isoelectronic might be a new vocabulary word for you. It means having the same electron configuration. So how do you predict the charge of anions and cations? Cations are very simple. The charge on the cation equals the number of electrons lost. So the charge on the cation is equal to the family number. For example, aluminum is group 3, so it becomes aluminum 3 plus. Let's visit the periodic table a moment. We can see that aluminum is indeed in group 3. So if we remove 1, 2, 3 electrons, it will have the same electron configuration as neon. If we were speaking of magnesium cation, we would want to remove 1, 2 electrons to be isoelectronic with neon. The charge on the anion will be the number of electrons gained. So it is the family number minus 8. An example is sulfur in group 6. The most common ion of sulfur is sulfur 2 minus. And if we go to a periodic table, we see that sulfur is in main group 6. And in order to be like a noble gas, it needs to gain 1, 2 electrons to become isoelectronic with argon. If we were discussing fluorine, fluorine would like to get one electron to become isoelectronic with neon. So here is a question for you. What are the expected charges for phosphorus and calcium when they form ions? I hope you have your periodic table in front of you and you recognize that phosphorus is a nonmetal and calcium is a metal. Now that we've covered the charges, let's look at the electron configuration of cations. The valence electrons in the highest n quantum number are lost first. When valence electrons have the same n, which is the same principal quantum number, the electrons in the highest l quantum number are lost first. So this means that electrons are not removed in the same order they were added. One removes any valence P first, followed by valence S, and then finally valence D. You notice when we added them, we go S, D, P. But S electrons are removed before D electrons. So here are some examples of electron configuration of cations. Neutral sodium is neon 3s1. So we have one valence electron to remove to get sodium 1 plus, which is isoelectronic with neon. Calcium has two valence electrons. So when we remove those, 
the electron configuration is argon. Neutral zirconium has electron configuration krypton, 5s2, 4d2. So if we want to remove just two electrons to have a 2 plus charge, which one shall we remove first, the 5s or the 4d? And I hope you say the 5s. So the electron configuration of zirconium 2 plus is krypton 4d2. Manganese has this electron configuration shown. And if we're going to make manganese 2 plus, which electron should we remove first, 4s or 3d? And I hope you say 4s. So the manganese 2 plus is argon 3d5. How about indium? Indium has this electron configuration where we have 5s2, 4d10, 5p1. If we would like to remove one electron, we'll start with the highest n, and there's a tie with 5s and 5p, so now we'll go to the highest l. So we will remove the 5p1 electron first. So indium 1 plus has the electron configuration krypton, 5s2, 4d10. If we would like to make indium 3 plus, we will remove the 5p electron and the 5s electron because the highest principal quantum numbers are lost first. So this electron configuration will be krypton 4d10. For the electron configuration of anions, the new electrons go into the lowest energy orbital that is available. So if we think of neutral chlorine, this is the electron configuration here. We have 3p5. So clearly, we have room for just one more electron. So this could be chloride with a negative one charge, and we could write neon 3s2, 3p6, but I think it's easier to just write argon. So when dealing with anions, we simply need to step to the right. The electron configuration of Cl1- minus is argon. For neutral selenium, the electron configuration has at the end 4p4, so there is space for two more electrons. So this would be selenide with a 2 minus charge, and we could fill this 4p sublevel, but it would be easier to say krypton. For nitrogen, the last level is 2p3, so we have room for three more p electrons, so that is nitride with a 3 minus charge, and we could write it out the long way, but it is isoelectronic with neon. Fluorine's last sublevel is 2p5. It has room for one more electron, so it becomes fluoride 1 minus. And written shorthand, it is isoelectronic with neon. So here is a series of isoelectronic ions. Sodium 1 plus has the ion electron configuration of neon. And so does magnesium 2 plus, and so does nitrogen 3 minus, and oxygen 2 minus, and fluorine 1 minus. Now keep in mind that although these are all isoelectronic with neon, they will have different sizes because they have different Z effectives, which are also affected by the loss of electrons. So the smallest one in this series would be magnesium 2 plus. It has a high Z effective, a 2 plus charge, and it's going to draw in those electrons to make the radius smaller. The largest in this series would be nitrogen 3 minus. It has a lower Z effective and three extra electrons, which are going to make it become larger as those electrons are more spread out and further away from the nucleus. So I hope that you have your periodic table in front of you, 
and I would like you to figure out what is the expected charge on arsenic and the electron configuration of that ion. And at this point you're saying, wait a minute, I was given a metalloid. Are those cations or anions? Well, they can be either. So you'll have to figure out which of the answers matches correctly for either the cation or the anion. Here is another question. What is the expected charge on cesium and the electron configuration of that ion? This one asks, what is the expected charge on nickel and the electron configuration of that ion? For this one, I'm going to help you a little bit. Removing the first electron requires some energy. Removing a second electron to get to a plus two charge requires even more energy. A great deal of energy is required to remove eight electrons. So nickel plus eight and nickel plus 10 really are not options. It requires too much energy to generate these. So consider nickel two plus and go from there.